thank you for the introduction and uh, the invitation. Uh, so, um, okay, we have learned during this workshop that uh, large-scale learning, so to, to, to deal with large-scale learning problems, uh, statistical aspects and optimization aspects has to be treated jointly. jointly. One example of this is the stochastic gradient method that uh, today is uh, an algorithm of, of choice for these kind of problems. So uh, my the, our work started from the observation that there are several results uh, studying uh, uh, generalization properties of uh, one pass uh, stochastic gradient descent, but uh, in practice very often uh, other uh, heuristics are used such as multiple passes over the data or um, and combined, usually combined with early stopping. So um, what I'm going to present today are some theoretical results about these kind of heuristics and in particular the generalization properties of uh, such kind of variants of SGD. Uh, so I will call it uh, randomly stochastic gradient method, stochastic gradient descent, so uh, okay, SGM, SGD. So I start from the problem setting. We consider a linear regression in uh, an abstract Hilbert space with the uh, uh, square loss. So the choice of the square loss is um, critical in our, in our analysis. All that I'm going to say uh, heavily depends on this choice. So um, probably I will forget to, s to say this again during the talk, but uh, so square loss plays a, a crucial role. So the objective in uh, learning or in stochastic optimization is to minimize a functional E which can be written as an expectation. So in this case, again, the expectation of a square loss, which depends uh, in our setting linearly from uh, uh, W. So, uh, and uh, uh, the problem here is the fact that the measure rho in general is unknown, but we only have uh, some, uh, uh, we can only access to a finite number of points that are called uh, examples. And uh, so I, I have access only to these uh, points that are independent and uh, uh, identical. So are randomly sampled from rho. Okay. So this, uh, this setting naturally includes the linear regression with Gaussian noise in Rd. So if I fix H to be Rd, I have uh, I can um, so I can generate data, for instance, by randomly sample points. Uh, xi in Rd and then uh, by measuring some uh, um, linear measurements corrupted by Gaussian noise, delta i. And, uh, but also this framework includes, for instance, functional regression if my input points belong to an infinite dimensional space, for instance, our curves or functions. Also, uh, this is, a, let's say, is an, almost is an equivalent way to write um, the learning problem in reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So um, if you consider learning in, a, uh, in a, an RKHS, then uh, what you want to do is to minimize this, uh, again, this uh, risk, where this time the function w that I want to find, so the element in HK is a function now, depends non-linearly from the input variable. But uh, uh, as I think uh, most of you know, uh, if I am, um, if W is a function in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space generated by a kernel K, then uh, we have the reproducing property. Therefore, W evaluated at the point can be written as uh, a scalar product between uh, two elements in our Hilbert space H. K. So Xi here is like X. Uh, exactly. So Xi are the inputs that you will see in a moment why I don't call it X. <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, and uh, so the xi are the, can, be, uh, can be seen as the input space, r is the output space, okay? And w is a function mapping the input into the output space. So what I can do is to consider a, a function that identifies the input point xi with the kernel evaluated at this point xi and send y, so leave y unchanged. And then if I consider this change of variables inside this um, integral uh, functional. What I can write is that I use first the kernel trick. So W of xi is the, uh, the product, okay, the, the scalar product between W and K xi, and then I use the change of variable and I'm back to the model I'm presented at the beginning. 
Okay. So, um, in this setting, a classical approach is Tikhonov regularization. So, uh, what I want to do in the rest of my talk is to start from uh, some very classical and basic results about uh, Tikhonov regularization for learning problems. And uh, to then um, I will state some assumption and then state the main results and then I will compare them with uh, the one that we get uh, in uh, for stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so uh, what is uh, uh, the um, Tikhonov estimator, the regularized empirical risk estimator? Okay, is a, is a point in my space age that uh, can be built in this way. So I first replace the risk, which is unknown by its empirical version. And then I add to this risk a regularization function, R, that uh, in this talk will be the square of the norm. Okay. Um, the, uh, then what I do is that uh, I minimize this regularized empirical risk and I build this estimator W hat, which depends from a parameter, which is the regularization parameter that balances the, the weight of the regularizer against the data fitting, the data fitting term. This, uh, so the properties of this estimator has been studied a lot, but mainly from a statistical point of view. So uh, now I want to present to you some um, statistics proper, statistical properties of this estimator. In order to do that, I need to introduce uh, some uh, um, assumptions. And uh, so the, the first one is a fairly standard assumption, basically requires that my measure rho is uh, as a bounded support. So all my point axes, uh, the norm of my point axis is bounded almost surely and uh, the same holds for the output y. So the second one uh, is uh, this, okay, this assumption can be relaxed for what I'm going to say, but uh, I will consider this, uh, this simpler setting. Another assumption that I do in this talk is the fact that uh, my, mm, the risk has a minimizer. And therefore, it, mm, since it has at least a minimizer, the, the set of minimizers is non-empty, and I can consider the uh, minimal norm solution. This is a less a standard assumption. It's a, a, let's say, a particular uh, case in learning that is refer we, mm, I will call mm, the attainable case, so where you have uh, exactly one uh, target uh, parameter to estimate. Um, so, uh, under these assumptions, you, you can already prove some consistency results or of the Tikhonov estimator, but uh, uh, more assumptions are needed if we want to have uh, more precise uh, bounds, so non-asymptotic bounds for the error. So, so the, yeah? the existence here is just because you're per perhaps in finite, infinite dimension, right? If you're in finite dimension, if you're bounded, in this case, you will have always a solution. Right? Uh, uh, so in infinite dimensional, no. In no, finite no. dimensional, uh, so yes, bound, bounded sets are compact, therefore I have a convex uh, uh, operator. Yes, yes, convex, convex continuous operator, the risk in this case it is, and therefore I have a minimizer. Because yeah. will you use the infinite uh, dimensions anywhere else in the talk in the future? Or can, can we always think each type you, you say about something that we're in fine dimension and W is just... Yes, you, you can. You can. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a comment, uh, so you know, there's a thing like the infinite dimension, but you see that the number of W star is very large. Yeah, it can be. Yes. So large that it is infinite. No, it is, uh, that is finite. Right? It is finite, but you don't have maybe an estimation, for instance. You, you, look. No, sorry, my comment was the other again. So, yes, my comment was if you don't assume that W is in the set, it's like having uh, W star being very large in a finite dimensional set. Mm -hmm. uh, here, you assume that W star is finite and the norm is reasonably small. I see. Okay. This is a standard optimization. Uh, So some of the results, so I'm presenting the results in these settings, some of the results that I will present hold even without this assumption, but uh, in this talk uh, we, I will assume that this holds. So mainly because I want to introduce this uh, source condition, that is the uh, technical condition that allows to get these error bounds. So in, uh, first I, want, I, I define T, which is the second moment operator, so it's an operator linear from H to H, and is uh, well-defined, bounded, C, thanks to the boundedness assumption that uh, I just uh, assume. Okay, 
the, what, what is this source condition? So it uh, can be read as a regularity assumption of the solution I am assuming to exist. And uh, more precisely, it asks that uh, the solution, the minimal norm solution, belongs to the range, not only to the range of t, but to the range of t at a certain power. Okay? So um, uh, I will use this strange uh, indexing just for, for easy <laughs> to, to, to make easier the comparison with the existing result, because this is the usual uh, scaling that he used, is used in the available results, in the available papers. OK. What does it mean? So with the picture, uh, we have the space H. If R is equal to 1 alpha, I'm not asking anything, since uh, T to the 0 is the identity. Therefore, I'm just asking the existence of the minimizer. If R is bigger than 1 alpha, then these, uh, these um, um, spaces that are vector spaces, subspaces of H, are nested. And as R increases, my condition is stronger. Okay. So as R increasing, I'm requiring more regularity to my uh, solution. Why uh, do I call it uh, regularity? Here is another interpretation. So the operator T is a compact operator from H to H, self-adjoint. Therefore, I can uh, uh, di mm, diagonalize it and build a, a sequence of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay? So my, my point W dagger belongs to H. This is a basis of H, let's say. And uh, so this, this quantity is finite. So this is, this is equivalent to existence of W dagger. What does the source condition mean, asks? So uh, it asks that uh, since W dagger is in the run of T, then H, I can invert this operator. And I can write H in this way. Therefore, H belongs to A, to the capital H. And here, what I can do, I can uh, compute this quantity using this uh, basis of H, and I get this condition. So I get that since H is as a finite norm, this sum here is finite. What does it mean? Uh, so remember that these uh, eigenvalues are going to zero. We have a compact operator. Okay. So this this uh, this inequality here asks that these mm, coefficients, these Fourier coefficients, go to zero sufficiently fast, okay? so faster than usual. So this is the usual, and this is the stronger, the, 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 the stronger assumption. Okay. okay, so with this condition, so boundedness plus source condition, we can prove the following um, error bounds on the um, um, Tikhonov regularized uh, uh, estimator. So um, the, the key point here is the choice of the regularization parameter. As you see, I, ca I can prove that uh, I have some bounds. If I choose the regularization parameter in, as uh, uh, dependent on n in this way, so in a way that depends on this source condition. Um, what I get here is that if r is smaller than 3 halves, then I have this rate that uh, increases as r increases. But then at a certain point, this rate doesn't increase anymore, and it stops, and is minus 1 half. So if r is bigger than 3 halves, the, even if I'm requiring a stronger regularity on my uh, solution, I will not be able to uh, approximate it in a faster way. OK, so what's the idea? Just the idea of the proof is a bias variance trade-off. So what I do here is uh, I introduce an auxiliary point, W lambda, which is the minimizer of the risk, true risk, plus a regularization. So uh, I will not have access to this point, but I don't need to compute it. I just use it as a reference point. And then I, de I can decompose the difference of the norm between my estimator and my true uh, parameter W dagger as uh, the sum of, um, I can bound this um, norm uh, with the sum of these two terms. And as you can see here, I, we have a term that depends on the sample and the term that depends only on the choice of lambda, so on the regularization properties of my approach. So uh, using, so balancing the two terms give, since this, uh, this, um, the behavior of this term is uh, determined by the choice of the, by the source condition, we will have the we will have the result. So these results, the results that I showed, are minimax. In this sense, so um, 
in the sense that uh, if you fix a class of probability measures, and in this case, the class of probability me measures that I fix are the ones that are satisfy the assumptions I just introduced, then, um, OK, I will have a different solution for each, uh, in general, a different solution for each probability measure. And I can, uh, if I fix an algorithm, I can compute the, the, distance between the, the distance between my algorithm and my estimator and my true parameter. Then I can do a worst case uh, analysis in the sense that I, pu I put in front of it a maximum. Therefore, I take uh, the problem on which my algorithm behaves worst. And then among all, these, all the algorithms that I have at my disposal, I take the best one. So I take, take the algorithm which has the best worst behavior. OK, and as you can see here, uh, I don't know if you remember the, um, the exponent in the bounds for the Tikhonov regularization. You get uh, the, the exponent to this n is the same. Therefore, the, the yes. Oh, sorry, sir. Is there a reason why you're choosing to do this in that Hilbert norm rather than the two norm? OK, yes. Uh, so the reason is the following. Uh, the results that, I'm going to, that we obtained for uh, multiple passes SGD are optimal, minimax, uh, in the H norm. But are not, we still, let's say be optimistic, still don't have optimal results for the error. Yeah. That's why I'm going to present these results. But basically, you can do the same replacing the, the norm with the error and the r minus 1 half with 2r. Okay. OK, and you get the same. OK. So the, what happens, what I told for r bigger than 3 halves is the fact that uh, you do not, even if you're asking more to your solution, you don't see this, uh, this regularity. And uh, this is called a sat as a saturation. So Tikhonov regularization has a saturation effect. And um, the problem in practice is the fact that uh, you do not know r. So uh, you do not know how to choose the regularization parameter. And so usually you need some adaptive uh, results. And in this case, since we are dealing with the H norm, we will, you can use, for instance, Lepsky, also known as balancing principle, that uh, allows to recover these optimal rates. OK. So if you, finally, if you assume some uh, um, further um, uh, assumptions on your operator t, so that uh, more precisely the eigenvalues decay with at a certain rate, then you can prove uh, improved rates, so that are called comp capacity dependent rates. So that depends on this decay of the eigenvalues and are more precise, more, uh, let's say, tailored to the properties of your operator t. So in the, in the talk, I will uh, uh, consider the capacity independent uh, setting. OK. But there is a but, so all the analysis that I showed to you does not take into account the optimization error. So um, there is a, OK, so what, mm, what can we do? So someone did it already. So there is a, in the paper by Boutou and Bousquet, we can, um, what they suggest is the fact that if we are in the large scale scenario, Computing this uh, estimator w at lambda can be costly. And so this estimator is the solution of a minimization problem and does not come automatically out of your computer, but you will need to approximate it, to compute it. And so what makes more sense in this scenario, since this will be a, a bottleneck, is to analyze the behavior of, uh, a, let's say, an approximation of the true minimizer. Okay. So uh, I will um, denote it with the lambda and t, meaning that t is the, so th that this w hat lambda t is the outcome of the teeth iteration of an iterative procedure applied to the regularized empirical risk. So to the classical uh, bias variance decomposition, we add another term, which is an optimization term. So the first, uh, the first obvious uh, com let's say comment or consideration that one can do looking at this decomposition is that uh, it, mm, when we use an optimization procedure in order to optimize the regularized empirical risk, it makes no sense to go beyond the statistical accuracy since uh, it will be um, not, uh, so it will be lost, let's say, the, the additional effort will be lost. Um, 
Okay, so what can you, so, so, okay, so on uh, one hand, uh, this decomposition, so um, parallel to this observation, let's say in the last year, in the last years there have been a very active research on optimization methods to solve problems that have exactly this form, so that can be interpreted as, uh, let's say, regularized empirical risk functions, so that are, have the structure of, uh, have some structure and uh, maybe are strong, possibly are strongly convex or not and uh, especially in the large scale scenario. So there, have been, uh, a, there has been a huge amount of work on uh, methods that scale to these dimensions, so are first order, and in a sense are not, are not blind with respect to the structure of the function we optimize, so take into account that we are minimizing a sum. So I'm thinking to uh, both first order method, but uh, splitting, uh, stochastic, uh, uh, incremental, aggregated, uh, um, okay, so all these class of methods. So um, what we can do once that we have the convergence properties, so the complexity bounds on these optimization methods, we can think to balance these two terms and to obtain some new uh, trade-off that include also the uh, number of steps that are needed in order to approximate my my, um, okay, my, my true parameter. What uh, we can also do, and uh, it's uh, what uh, I will do now, is to instead take another uh, direction and to abandon this uh, uh, decomposition, trying to, to, to have one that does not split, uh, let's say, the statistical part with, from the optimization one. Okay, so... Uh, Stochastic gradient method is maybe the algorithm that does this job. So the idea is that uh, we forget the empirical risk and we try directly to minimize our true risk, so the expected error. In this case, uh, and with what? With uh, a stochastic gradient descent method, since we do not have access to the true gradient, since the, our measure is unknown. So one possibility is to use this, this uh, simple version where um, each step is determined by, uh, so each uh, stochastic approximation of the gradient is given by a single sample point. And uh, so the, the in this setting there is no explicit regularization, we do not have explicitly lambda appearing. And uh, we have also several theoretical results. So uh, under various assumptions uh, that uh, establish some uh, convergence results of this iteration towards the minimizer or the minimum of the true risk. But what's the, the, the point here? So what, what the point I want to make is the fact that uh, in practice, very often, multiple passes over the data are done. So I'm, of course, considering a situation in which I know how many data I have, so it's not a truly online situation because I know the horizon. I know how many data I will see and in which I have the possibility to see, to visit them more than once. But this is done in practice, and so the, our idea was to try to explain from a theoretical point of view why this work. Okay, so I rewrite, we focused on the simplest mm, version of a, a multiple passes stochastic gradient, which is a cyclic version. So I rewrite the iteration in order to, uh, to uh, make some points. So the... As you can see here, so the, okay, if you look at multiple passes stochastic gradient, this can be in immediately interpreted as a, a minimization procedure for the empirical risk. So this is well known. If we uh, visit each point infinite times, we will converge to the minimum of the uh, empirical risk. But the other, the, then the other observation that can be ma made uh, is the fact that uh, uh, each step is a gradient so it's a stochastic gradient step, uh, as before. And uh, why I use this uh, strange decomposition, uh, so in, with an inner loop and an outer one, because I wanted to, to keep this number t, to put in, in, uh, in evidence this number t, which is the number of passes over the data, and that are usually no, called, that is usually called epoch. Okay. Uh, so the main question here that I try to answer is uh, how many passes should we do? Should we, how many times should we uh, see our visit our data in order to minimize the true risk? So what's the, what's the point? 
So as I told you, uh, there is, there, there is a, a, let's say the, the convergence of uh, the iteration towards the, minima to the minimum of the empirical risk is well established. So starting from Bertsekas, but also before Guy Voronsky, Poliak, so there are many, so it's let's say it's classical. But what we would like is to prove this kind of result. So what's the point? And the idea is uh, to exploit stability properties of uh, our uh, stochastic gradient and early stopping. How? So we first introduce an auxiliary iteration, which is uh, uh, the gradient descent applied to the uh, true risk, WT. As you can see here, the step, I fix the step size, which is gamma over n. Gamma is a constant, n is the number of points. And uh, I write the gradient descent in this strange way in order to make the comparison easier with the incremental method. So uh, Wt, if you want, Wt plus 1 will be the result of t plus 1, uh, let's say n t plus 1 iterations of uh, uh, the gradient descent on the true risk. So what happens, we know that this uh, it's a gradient descent applied to the risk, this uh, iteration will converge to the minimizer of the risk. Okay? On the other hand, what I have is that I have the, uh, our, my say, multiple passes, stochastic gradient, applied to the empirical risk, and I will prove that for a certain time these two iterations are close to each other, but then after a while this uh, iteration deviates from my, from my uh, goal and goes towards the minimizer of the empirical risk. So the, the, the job here is to detect, let's say, this, this, this zone where the uh, approximation of uh, my true objective holds. Okay? So, so I'm a bit confused here because yeah. uh, if you're using fixed step size and you're not averaging, then you're not converging. So okay, that's uh, yes, it's true. So the, here I cheated a little bit. The step side note that this. So here, this one is converging. Do you agree? No. So this is a true gradient applied to a convex functional. I so I fix step size. But your your your. And is fixed. Oh, the, the there was no x i. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Instead, this one, it, it, so this, so on this one, I, so it's not uh, very true, let's say. It's true in, uh, so, sorry, in function values, for sure. But here we do not, do not assume strong convexity, so that's the a, a subtle point, but it's not, I think, important uh, or essential for, for the presentation. Okay, uh, so before uh, giving the theoretical results, let's see what happens in practice. So what it, we did here is a very simple simulation. We uh, generated some, uh, so it's a linear regression problem. We generated some uh, random points uniformly in RD and uh, some um, noisy measurements, YI. And then we divided these points into a training and a test set. And we applied this incremental stochastic gradient. So what happens is that if you uh, look at the training error, so more or less is decreasing, right? We know that uh, since it's an incremental, it will not be a descent method, but this, this, uh, this converts towards the, the minimum. While if you monitor the uh, test set, what happens is that which should be a good uh, approximation of our true error, expected error, what happens is that after some uh, iterations, this uh, curve starts to, to go up, to, to go up again, and therefore we start in, a, let's say, an overfitting region, right? And we should better early stop our iterations here instead of going uh, until the end. How many points here? So, yes, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, w I tried to, so it's, it's an old figure. Uh, I think that here should be, I think it's uh, around like uh, 30, 50, less than 100. So, and this is the number of iterations. So, uh, should be, I think, could be, the, I think that there is the right answer is 30 points, and this is the true number of iterations. So, here is uh, really the first epoch. So, the first epoch is very effective here, and then it starts decreasing a little slower. And I guess 
do you know like what like function you are like what R is for this particular simulation? Or Sorry. What function or what R? So it's it's a linear function, yeah. linear regression, I and I don't know what is D. So it was really just a a, a plot to to show the behavior, but it's a linear function in uh, in some R D. So x i are in R D and y i are in R. Okay. Okay, so here there is an example. There the, the, the should be another point of view, another uh, perspective on a similar example, not the same. So uh, here we have uh, this I know better because it's more recent. So here is uh, we try to approximate, uh, is again a linear regression problem, but uh, it's a function that can be written as a linear combination of trigonometric functions. So here we have uh, 40 trigonometric functions, and if I'm not wrong, I don't know exactly the point, uh, 30, 40. Okay, so this is the result, uh, what happens after the first epoch of incremental uh, gradient. And that's what happened after the 10th. And that's what happens after the 100th epoch. So that's, that's the idea. The idea is to stop the iteration in the middle in order to achieve, let's say, a, a, a reasonable approximation, so a, a regularized approximation of our points. Okay. So, uh, result, uh, if uh, we assume so only boundedness and existence of a solution without uh, assuming any source condition, what we can prove is the following. So fix the step size. As you can see here, the step size depends on our boundedness, uh, const on our constant, unknown in general. And, um, so what happens is that we can prove that this uh, estimator is uh, uh, universally consistent, so converges almost surely to the true one, if we assume two things. First, the number of epochs goes to infinity as the number of points grow. And second, it goes to infinity not too fast. So this can be interpreted, so yes, I have the comments. So the, the comments that we can make on this statement are three. So this step size is fixed, OK, is a constant. But uh, I, I recall you that is divided by n in the implementation. And uh, so the, the what, what this says is that uh, on one hand, early stopping is needed to achieve consistency. So this can be interpreted as an early stopping rule, since we the number of apples should not go to infinity too fast. But on the other hand, the number so we, we need multiple passes. So what this result says is that with our analysis, with this choice of step size, you need multiple passes. OK? There are single pass to achieve the same. Like single pass, and don't know that single pass achieve the exact same pass. OK, I arrive. I, uh, just wait. Is it needed? Yeah, 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 I need it. Yes, it's needed with this. Uh, so what I'm saying is needed with this That's choice of step size. OK? So uh, I, uh, yes, just comment, brief comment on this. What we so what we proved is that if you do, if you take a very small step size, so gamma over n, and you do multiple passes, where multiple passes is of the order of uh, um, this quantity here, then uh, you have consistency. On the other hand, what you can prove is that if we do one pass stochastic gradient method, and you choose a larger step size and you choose just one epoch, then you will achieve the same result. Okay, uh, so here again is the same uh, imprecision that I mentioned before. So I'm stating this for the iterates, so for the, for the Ws. This is not uh, known, I think, uh, so, but, so the, the, the idea is this one. If we care about the error, the, the comparison is this one. So why multiple passes make sense? Why should I do smaller step size and visiting the data more than once instead of doing only one pass with a longer step size. So I, I try, I hope I will uh, convince it th that this makes sense in the following slides. So uh, that's where the source condition comes into play. So um, if we want finite sample bounds, we need to assume a source condition. And uh, in this case, we can still prove high probability, um, let's say, we, we can prove high probability, uh, that convergence with high probability with uh, this uh, uh, rate here, exponent here, if the number of passes over the data depends on our, is proportional, let's say, to, uh, not proportional, but depends on the regularity of our, of the sort solution. 
So, uh, what does uh, some comments again? What does it tell us? The fact that uh, first the, the rates are minimax again, so are optimal, the same that I showed at the beginning for Tikhonov method. Good news, there is no saturation with this uh, method, so R, uh, even if R goes to infinity, so as R goes to infinity, this uh, um, rate is in improving, so it's uh, increasing until uh, squ square root of n. And uh, the, uh, yeah, probably. And the stopping rule, so uh, what happens is that this, the only thing that I have to um, tune, let's say, to, I, have to, I need to be adaptive, is the stopping rule, therefore the number of passes over the data. So also here, as in the Tikhonov case, I can use, I can get adaptive results by using, for instance, again, a balancing principle. Okay, so now I'd like to do a second round of comparison with the stochastic one pass stochastic gradient. So, uh, in order to compare with the existing results mm, that, uh, let's say, are in the same setting as ours, so in an infinite dimension, dimensional setting, taking into account the source condition, I add this, uh, um, um, let's say, regular ad um, additional regularization term in order to compare with all of them. Okay. So the, the, the theory, as I said at the beginning, about stochastic gradient as a long history, so convergence in finite dimensional case for strongly convex function is classical and goes back to Robbins and Monroe. And there, are, there have been um, many other developments later. Instead, in an uh, infinite dimensional case and specifically in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with the, the square loss, uh, I would say that th the analysis starts from this uh, paper by Ismail and Yao in 2006. So the, there are um, two, three, basic, three, three papers on which I think it's uh, um, useful to compare, uh, with which is useful to compare our results. And this, this paper by um, Yming Ging and Pontil, this by Tares and Yao, and this by Francis and Aymeric Dieleveux. So um, the... Um, Okay, first, uh, I say <laughs> first things that are less relevant, not less relevant, but less relevant for what I'm going to say later. So first, uh, this is the only paper which is able to, uh, cons to obtain capacity dependent bounds. So the same that uh, old for Tikhonov regularization. So that uh, is able to take into account the um, effective dimension of the problem. So to interpolate between the finite and infinite dimensional case. Uh, the other two, mm, two cases instead are in the capacity, uh, cap are capacity independent rates as ours. And uh, as you can see, there is a difference. Mm, we have some methods which have saturation, for instance, this one or this one, and this one by Iming and Pontil that does not uh, saturate. So, and uh, the, there are different results in expectation and with high probability. The only one with high probability is this one as ours, and usually the analysis to obtain high probability bounds is more involved. So now I want to say the, 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 the only comment that uh, I think is uh, really relevant here. So as you can see here, also in this case is true, by the way, the um, in order, so they, ah, okay, and all these uh, papers obtain optimal rates, minimax rates, okay? So they are indistinguishable from a statistical point of view, all the methods that I presented. The, um, uh, so the point here is that in order to achieve these rates, both in, in all these papers, the step size depends on the source condition, on the parameter R, R in the source condition. Here we have only gamma, also here, and here we have ga both gamma and lambda. So the, the new picture is the following. So we now, I think... Is it also the case in the third paper, the one from... The yes, also here the gamma depends on the source condition. Okay, so we, here we have the, the new picture, let's say. We, we can, basically we have two regimes in which we can achieve minimax rates. One is the one in which you take a small step size, universal, so not dependent on the source condition and the number of passes on the data that depends on your source condition. The other one is where the, the, the case where you do one pass with a bigger step size and you do only one pass, possibly with averaging. So I think that, so in, bo in both cases, 
uh, what I want to say is that uh, model selection is needed. And uh, in uh, here, to, to sell in order to achieve minimax rates, here you have to select the right step size. And here you have to select the right number of passes over the data. So uh, from this point of view, uh, what I'm claiming is that our method is, comes as a natural approach, in the sense that uh, what you can do, for instance, is to have your training error uh, and divide it and keep a, a test and just monitoring online the, let's say, the, the behavior of the test error and simply stop when this when overfitting happens. So that's, I think it's the, so the, 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 the main difference is the, who plays uh, here is, who plays the role of the regularization parameter. Here is the step size, here is the number of passes. And what I'm saying, and I repeat just to, is that the, um, to um, being adaptive on the, the number of passes of the, over the data is natural and can, can be done. Yeah, I mean, is it sort of too far a leap to say that like all that really matters is the sum of the step size being kind of the same whatever right. approach you use because I guess the sum of the steps. Yeah, the steps. Uh, yes, this. So the uh, here, all the analysis uh, that I have in mind with the constant step size. Let's say con constant divided by n. Uh, but uh, yes, for instance, for the approximation error. So that is the optimization error here. What really matters is the sum of the step size, and the same I believe for the. Uh, so it's certainly the same for the sample error. So yeah. if you use different step sizes, as long as the sum kind of stays the same, you'll get opt or. Uh, so the point is that from our analysis, you can derive some uh, convergence for this case. So for t star equal one. So if you take into account the gamma, and if you take gamma depending on the source condition, so you can. But the point is that we do not get optimal rates, and uh, um, we do not. Yes, and we do not get optimal rates, and the step size that are derived from our analysis are too small. So we. So an open problem, a future, let's say. Uh, direction of research would be to understand what is the analysis, if there is an analysis that allows to interpolate between the uh, long step size one pass uh, towards the short step, uh, step size multiple passes. Yeah, because here to link back to this, the triangle of computation, statistics, mm -hmm. and uh, something else. So here, uh, the multiple passes, if you actually count the, the, the gradient cost as expensive, yeah, it, can it, be it's be much more expensive. Like, yeah, much a, yeah, yeah, it's true. It, it depends on what, what you have to do here in order to select the right step size. So probably you will have to do multiple passes, maybe on less data, just to adjust the step size. I don't know, to, okay. yeah? So, for why not doing like a constant step size? I'm sure you can derive similar results with gamma t equals gamma, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with the early stopping, which should be much earlier. So gamma constant. Yeah, so uh, so our so in our case at the moment we are not able to do it. Yeah, it would be the would be great. It's always <laughs> convergent. So if you do a single pass with a fixed gamma, always convergent. It will be very slow. But with multiple passes, you must. You, must you, you reduce the variance, maybe. I, 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 no, I don't know. <laughs> Only because you know, in fact, no. I don't know. You, you, need, you need smaller step sizes. Mm. Constant is too big. Yeah, because uh, because uh, as you can see, it's, so as we, uh, if you look at the let's say sample error, so the stability it increases with gamma. Therefore, I don't know. No, no, but I think mm. that you need like uh, as a, the second method it needs like a smaller step size. So you can only get smaller and do multiple passes. Yeah, but you, can, uh, you cannot be bigger. You, you would do. We need to less. We need to do less than a single pass. Exactly. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. Yes, what, yes, it's exactly like this. So you, we can prove that, so from our analysis, you can derive that you have a convergence for t star n equal one, and here gamma should be a gamma of n increasing. Okay, I don't know if this answer to the question. Okay, so um, just one last comparison. There is also gradient descent. So uh, we know that gradient descent on the empirical risk with early stopping works. And uh, what uh, I can say is that, um, so from the computational point of view, and uh, both from the computational and the statistical point of view, there is uh, apparently no difference between multiple passes, stochastic gradient, and uh, um, gradient, the full gradient. So one uh, point, to be, this is one point to be understood. And uh, I have to say that is one point to be understood also in the optimization scenario. In the same, I mean, same computation, no, no, because current descent is being more iterations, no? I know, no. So the, you can prove that the stopping time is the same. So if you, let's say, do the mapping 
so one epoch equal to one, pa one uh, pass is this exactly the same. Same stopping time, same step size. But you can use a constant step size with batch mode. You can use a constant step size I think, for batch mode problems. Yeah. Yeah, but should be smaller. I think that the Lipschitz constant of the empirical reference shows you have the one over n appearing. So if I said correctly, what you're missing is the uh, capacity dependent. Yes, for sure. This one we are not uh, at the moment. We don't it have an. It seems feasible if you combine what to do, but but Emrek give to combine and to get like the two. Uh, would be would be nice. Yeah. So uh, on this, what, uh, so the, the, as I was saying, this is an open problem also in optimization. It's not clear what is the advantage of an incremental gradient method applied to a sum of uh, uh, parabolas instead of a gradient method. But uh, what is known is that, uh, so empirical observed at least, and uh, some, uh, let's say, almost theoretically justified, is that at least when you are far from the minimizer, at the beginning of the iteration, increment one pass of incremental is more or less equivalent to one full gradient pass until you do not enter in this confusion region where, where you're close to the, to the minimizer, but the minimizers of your uh, summons are away, so push you away from the true one. So this would be, uh, again, could be one reason why from empirically the incremental gradient has a better performance than the full one. OK, so uh, just uh, maybe some idea uh, of the proof. So just to, to see a trade-off, a new trade-off. So uh, we, uh, I recall you that uh, I consider I'm comparing my iteration with uh, the one, the true gradient one. And uh, so the, the bias variance trade-off this time is obtained by um, bounding this quantity here uh, with the difference between our, let's say, in multiple passes uh, stochastic gradient iteration with the gradient on the true risk. So this quantity here now, the bias, is exactly the optimization error, right? Because I am I'm applying the gradient method to minimize a, a function. Therefore, I'm, this is exactly the optimization error. And here, instead, I have the, the sampling that comes into play. And um, so as I showed you before with the picture, the idea will be prove, will to prove that this, this quantity is increasing with t, decreasing with n, and, uh, but mm, yes, and this quantity instead, of course, is decreasing with t. Therefore, the, the idea of the proof is to balance these two terms. OK, uh, mm, so I prepared just a few slides to, have, to give an idea of the proof. Uh, the, as I said at the beginning, so I don't forget, uh, all, as you can see also already from here, the, the square loss plays a, a very a crucial role because otherwise I do not have this expression of the, of the iterates. So the idea is that uh, I can write the iterate at the end of one epoch as a, a perturbed gradient descent iteration. So it's almost a gradient descent with step size gamma, but it, we have here a, a perturbation term. And so the idea will be to, um, yes, to compare this with the analog in the uh, continuous setting. So here I have an op this operator, is just this one, covariance operator, second moment. And uh, OK, this one is an element in H. And then here you have these two quantities that are quite complex, as you can see. Uh, so that's the, the, the point. Um, and the same you can do for the iteration on the, the expected risk. And you get more or less a, a very similar expression here, very similar A and B. And so what you do basically is to write the difference between these two iterates with, uh, by a sum of an operator, which has norm less than 1. And so you, you forget it. And then uh, you have this uh, sum here where you have always, let's say, an empirical um, mean and its uh, uh, expectation. So you compare the empirical mean with the expectation. And so basically you can apply uh, a concentration inequality to this. Uh, the only problem is for these two uh, complex terms here, because they are not sum of independent variables, but they are still sum of martingales. Therefore, the Pinelli's um, concentration inequality still apply. And then you get a bound of this form, increasing in t, decreasing in n, as I was saying, with high probability. 
The, uh, instead, the okay, the approximation error is standard, is well known, and uh, you can prove that uh, the, the the rate depends on the source condition and uh, on the sum of step size <laughs> that are constant. Okay, and so the the final result is obtained by balancing simply these two terms, and you obtain the the, the expression that I showed. Okay, so uh, the, the contributions, I think that uh, we, we, so the, we had some results that are the first results explaining, trying to explain the generalization properties of some uh, used heuristics for stochastic gradient and uh, more specifically multiple passes and early stopping. And uh, so some future work I already mentioned, therefore, uh, so some of these <laughs> mentioned already Francis. So I think that's, that's all, thank you. Okay, this is the paper, mainly. So, further questions and comments for Sylvia? And Simo can start if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, there was uh, no notion of uh, randomization within, a, within the past. Okay, so this. So we started from the cyclic one, thinking it was the easiest. Probably, I don't know if from, from the, for, for the analysis it is the easiest one. But in any case, uh, so uh, I think that already Lorenzo Rosasco with uh, Junong Lin uh, tried to generalize these results, uh, both to a non-square loss and uh, to uh, other sampling techniques. So uh, in particular, the stochastic one. So you visit the time, the, your points multiple times, but you, uh, you randomly select one. Because what is still missing, which would be very interesting, I think, is the random reshuffling, let's say. Because, because here is, um, you're saying that my data c came from some distribution ID. Mm -hmm. Then I have whatever order, I, and I'm just running I'm, it through I'm it cyclically, it. And, and you're saying everything is, is fine. Yeah, it works. It works. I mean, also in the deterministic cases like this, right, in optimization. But here it's all asymptotic, I guess. No, the key no, is that you really? can do that like full gradient of the equity risk up to a point where the start of the error, and this is a T star of N. I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile this kind of result with the earlier results we talked about during this workshop, where uh, having random permutation versus. Uh, you know, like uh, random sampling versus but the random. I think no. here the random sampling comes from the fact that you have random. So your points are IID, and th th that's it. So that's like a random. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then after after this, you can uh, let's say uh, this is just an optimization procedure to minimize the. It's not true, but to minimize the empirical risk, and uh, you can either access to your point to visit your points randomly. You can visit your points cyclically. You can choose to visit your points by randomly reshuffling them after each epoch. So in, from the optimization point of view, this la last uh, um, policy seems to be the best one empirically. There are some results, very recent results, uh, to show that it works also in theory. But I'm, I, so I don't know exactly the constants. How the, so what is known, that uh, at least uh, up to my knowledge, is that uh, the in the deterministic setting, so the incremental choice of the points behaves usually uh, worse than uh, the stochastic sampling. But for instance, in the strongly convex case, they are the same. Then it's, there is a recent paper by Gurbu, Zubalaban, Parillo, and uh, Osdaglar. Huh? Yeah, but there the constant is awful. Yeah, yeah, the constant, yeah, yes. The co it's a matter of the constants. So yeah, yeah. And yeah. N goes to infinity. Yeah. But still, it's linear. So, so it's from let's say we do not we don't see this effect here. I I I don't think so. What could happen? But I don't uh, so I, I don't think so that you mm, if your optimization so if your optimization procedure is better faster probably you can stop earlier. But would expect this more from an accelerated method than from the random. After one, yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, another question for uh, Sylvia? Yep. Mm. Uh, so could you question people? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> could you show uh, uh, your, your uh, convergence rates again? Yeah. Again, yeah. So the best R is the uh, in in uh, in uh, in infinity. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah you, but you cannot choose it, so it comes with your problem, right? So it's a datum of your problem. So what's the, the typical value of R? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. if, the, if, the data, uh, if the data is IIP, in the, in the traditional uh, 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 framework, we have the conversion rate is, is square root n, but in your case, your best convergence rate is square root n. Yeah, be careful because here we are looking at convergence of the iterates and not of the error. So the, the square root of n that you're talking about is on the error. Okay, so the, in this case would be on the error would be 2r divided by 2r plus 1, so it should be better than 1 alpha, I hope. <laughs> you should compare 1 alpha with this. So, uh, so when r goes to infinity, this goes to 1 over n. Okay. Other questions? Guillaume? Yeah, so, um, um, <laughs> I have a question related to basically, yeah, at the beginning you talked about regularization, and now, like, uh, this approach is not using regularization at all. So, basically, or maybe not, uh, maybe. No. Uh, so, uh, I basically have two questions. So, uh, if, I, if I know the value of R, um, which one is going to be faster to use uh, uh, early stopping? I mean, or, or to to uh, uh, I guess it's only one pass. If you know R, I would suggest to use one pass <laughs> because it's one pass. Yeah, <laughs> but so the point is that usually you don't know it, and uh, yes, the, the regularization comes from the early stopping. If you want, is the idea that is well known in the inverse problems literature where you in a sense, uh, exploit some uh, self-regularizing effect of iterative procedure. So you can interpret them as, uh, yes, as regularization procedures. And therefore, the early stopping of iteration allows you to get uh, uh, a form of implicit regularization. I understand, but like, could you add some, I mean, the fact of adding some regularization would uh, make your problem uh, you know, more strongly convex? Yeah. So yeah. it, it seems it would help you to make progress at the beginning, and then like, you know, is there a way to add regularization? Basically, uh, you want a cake and eat it, and you want <laughs> everything. But I guess so. I think it. Could. <laughs> no, I think it works. So you you can add it. You can apply it. We, you just add. also I think this analysis in, in the sense, but probably can be refined. What I fear is that the lambda will depend on R again. So you will have uh, some something like this. Where you're, uh, so that's you. You should then cross-validate also on this parameter. If you use a fixed lambda, but you know maybe you can change that. Uh, so if you use a fixed lambda, I don't know if you go to the. So if you are able to approximate the true uh, solution, I don't think so. I, I I'm not sure. No, no, I meant I meant that you you could allow lambda to change with t and not only with n. Ah, yes, yes, this is, oh, so, sorry, yes, of course. So I compared my results with, uh, uh, let's say, the results in the online setting where the horizon is known, because this makes more sense in the sense that we know the horizon, so it would be, but of course, uh, so here, so all these, const all these quantities here are constant with respect to t, but in the true online scenario, you will have something that varies with t, more or less in the same way. So will be, so will not be constant. Yes, you, you could do it, but I guess that will depend again on R, also in this case. Last question. And when you don't know R, what kind of uh, model selection procedure would you recommend? Uh, Cross-validation, maybe, because the stopping. So also for the... Guarantees on... Yes, 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 you have guarantees. You can achieve the same rates okay. with cross-validation. So for this, so for, for the iterates, you need a balancing principle. But since the stopping time is the same, both for the risk and the, and the iterates, you can play a little bit with this and use cross-validation. Okay, so let's thank uh, Sylvia again.